Good afternoon. I'm, uh, uh, it gives me pleasure to welcome back a friend to many, uh, uh, Admiral uh, Joseph Preer, who, uh, as you know, recently retired as the uh, Commander in Chief of uh, our Forces in the Pacific. He has been asked by Secretary Cohen to perform uh, a special intense um, review of our uh, flight safety procedures um, with Italy, um, in Italy, and he's here to report on the beginning of that uh, uh, process and to take some questions. Admiral Freer. Good afternoon to all of you, some familiar faces. It's uh, great to be with you. I just, what I'd like to do is just give a short preamble and then take a couple of questions. The, uh, the Secretary, uh, Secretary Coyne has asked me, as he was directed by the President, to work in conjunction with our Italian counterparts and to do a, an assessment to look at the corrective operational and safety procedures that have occurred since the tragic incident of the EA-6B clipping the uh, cable at uh, Cavallese. And we're supposed to assess the adequacy and determine if any additional safety procedures need to be made or be need to be taken in order to ensure the highest levels of safety. He has asked us to work again in full participation with our Italian counterparts and also keep in mind the safety of flight and our common NATO obligations, which uh, have implications throughout the region, and to report back to the Secretary, uh, to him and the Italian Minister of Defense to do that on the 15th of April. So we have a fairly compressed timeline. There are a couple of points I'd like to make that I think have been made before uh, by the President, by the Secretary of Defense and others, is the uh, profound sorrow and, uh, and regret that the people of the U.S. have over this incident, to not only to the people of Italy, but to the other uh, European nations who lost people in the gondola crash. The other point I'd like to make is we, as we work with the Italians and we work with them as partners for security and as in Europe as well as NATO partners, but we also work with the Italians not only as allies, but also amongst the most steadfast friends that the United States has in Europe. And we will, uh, we will approach this together uh, with the Italians as we go through this assessment and this investigation. What we've done so far, I, I, got, on the, I got on this job yesterday, so uh, my, my knowledge of it is, uh, is growing by leaps and bounds. But uh, we've had a chance to talk with my counterpart, who has been named by the Italians, General Tricarico, who is an Italian Air Force general on their air staff. I've talked to Ambassador Saleo, the Italian ambassador of the U.S., who's here in Washington. We have a game plan to uh, — we have a small team with support from the Joint Staff and also some direct support for us uh, to work together on this issue. We plan to go to Italy next week, and we'll visit Rome, we'll visit Cavalese, we'll visit Aviano and probably Naples, and then uh, come back out through Rome and probably touch base for NATO uh, reasons in Brussels as we, as we depart, and then come back and put our report together. The team is made up of members from each service and uh, well represented across the, uh, the levels of skill in, in uh, terms of tactical aviation and in terms of uh, legal and, and other ramifications that we may need. So with that as a, a preamble, I'd love to take a couple of your questions. Yes, sir. Basically, what's been done so far, Admiral, the changes that have been made so far? Well, there have been uh, quite a few changes that have been made so far, and that's one thing. We're having our first meeting with our team this afternoon. And we're going we're gonna to review some of the changes that have been made. It's been looked into extensively, and there have been quite a few changes, and we're going to review those and also take a fresh look at these. Is the Marine Corps, sir, or all the services? All the services. All Admiral, the services. Admiral, me, could you give yeah. us a little insight on low-level training proficiency? Uh, I mean, why do it? Or, uh, yeah, as a, from your viewpoint, you're, you're, a, right. you're a pilot. Yes. The, Low-level training proficiency, one, it's, uh, it's, it's something 
we need to do, tactical aviation needs to do, do this level of training or this type of training for flight safety, for ingress and egress from uh, particular target areas. So, and flying in close proximity to the ground is a, is a challenge that's different from air to air, and it's, some, it's a, an area in which people need to be uh, proficient and work at a high level of proficiency in case they're called upon to do it. With a prowler, I guess it was, uh, they said it's their only means for evading uh, an attack by an armed aggressor. Uh, that's a, probably an endlessly discussable point, but it's certainly one of their means of, of evasion, and it may be something they would have to do in ingressing or egressing from a target. The, uh, the Italian nation, I believe uh, the large majority, are incensed. They do not understand that there is not somebody that can take responsibility for this accident. And I take it there, there will be no uh, pilot or navigator that can do that. Uh, so what, uh, uh, what, are you, what are you going to do to address this issue that could very seriously uh, harm relations between Italy and the United States insofar as the military alliance is concerned? I, I think probably like most of us, I understand the, uh, I think well, the Italians' point of view. Uh, the, the, our nation, the, the president has said that our nation is fully responsible for this event, and we have taken responsibility for it. Like most tragedies that occur, there are usually a, a sequence of things that happen, and sometimes affixing blame to a single point is, is, uh, is much more difficult. Steve. Admiral, uh, you have the long career as an aviator. Have you trained in this area that uh, the accident occurred in yourself as a pilot? And secondly, have you ever flown an EA-6B? Uh, the second part first, because yes, I've flown an EA-6B. The first part is I have not, uh, I've, I've trained flying in Italy, but I've not, I've not flown in that, that particular region before. Uh, are, are you going to include accountability at all in your review? Accountability is not part of my charter. The Italian yes. government has uh, talked about suspending the status of forces agreement if, if there isn't um, um, accountability at a higher level. Uh, is is uh, are possible changes in the SOFA something that you would that you would look at? These are not uh, again. These are not uh, a part of our charter. Uh, it's. I think it'll be peripherally connected to our review, but that's not a part of our charter looking at the status of forces agreement. Admiral, we, we look at equipment issues such as concern about the radar altimeter. Yes. Are you going to look at those and, yes. you are gonna, and what uh, do you anticipate adding any money to repair <laughs> radar altimeters in, in prowler aircraft or not? Uh, the, uh, that it's too early to anticipate that, but we intend to look at the the factors involve people, they involve equipment, they involve supportive equipment, they involve training, they involve tactics, uh, they involve the infrastructure. We'll be looking at all of those things for possible improvements. If yes, ma'am. Uh, have you changed the maps so that they do now show that the, where the cable cars were and all the sorts of things that were not on the maps? Uh, I have not changed the map, no. The, uh, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> have the maps been changed? Uh, the, you know, what uh, from when I used to actually uh, fly, it's hard to keep maps updated all the time. And what they are, they are done, they're updated locally. And so the, where on the, the maps, the briefings that occur for people that fly in that vicinity, the fact of that, uh, that cable location is brief to everyone. And one of the things we'll be looking at is, is the map issue. We're, we're, I'm, uh, tuned to that, we'll be talking to NEMA, our National Imaging and Mapping Agency, and uh, we'll be talking with the Italians. The map issue is something we'll be considering. So the, the, those, those lines should have been part of a local briefing? That's correct. They were not on the map. In, in your preliminary <coughs> discussions with the Italians, uh, are, are they generally satisfied with the, the safety procedures that they were adopted <coughs> after uh, Cavalese, or are there specific things that they've raised with you? The, again, I have not had a lot of discussions with the Italians on this. I think the, the military people uh, and those that are doing the flying 
and my uh, reasonably cursory, but uh, not too bad a review of what's the, the corrections that have been made, they're, they're pretty good corrections that have been made. And so I think the people that know about it and are well involved in the issue think that a, a large number of good corrections have been made. The, I, I think what we need to work on is making sure that people at large that are uh, concerned about this issue know that level of effort that has gone on in this case. Could you yes, go back to the issue of the radar altimeter for a minute? Are you um, suggesting that there's a, an equipment problem with the altimeters across the EA-6B I point? didn't suggest it. Well, you said you're going to look at it. What are you going to we'll, we'll look at all of those things. The, the, the radar altimeter to tell your distance above the ground is a, is a key issue in low-level flying or, any, or approaches or anything like that. It's, a, it's sort of an obvious thing to, to look at in this case. Do you have any reason to believe that the altimeter in, in the EA-6B fleet is uh, not sufficient? I don't right now. As an experienced pilot, Admiral, uh, can you tell the difference without an altimeter between 1,000 feet and 360 feet? Uh, it depends on the type of terrain over which you're flying. And, uh, for example, if one is flying over water, it's very difficult to tell. If you're flying over the desert, it's very difficult to tell. If there are a lot of terrain features like trees and things like that where you can get relative size, it's, uh, it's something that you can, you, that much difference, you can usually tell that, that difference. Admiral, yes. uh, do you think that, that uh, low-level flying, that kind of training in Italy will, is, is still a requirement given this accident? Uh, yes, I do. I think it's something that it's a level of proficiency for not only for our country and for the Italians, but for, for NATO nations, uh, that low-level flying proficiency is something we need to be maintain and we need to do it in a, in a safe and a operationally uh, careful way. Can you go into more detail about some of the changes that have been made so far? I'd really rather not uh, right now. We're, that's one of the things we're tasked to look at. Uh, I've, I've read over a lot of the reports. I think one of the issues we'll be looking at is not only what are the written changes that have been made, but also what we get into, okay, how are they implemented? How, how, are, how is the training for implementing these changes, and how does that occur will be something we'll be looking at carefully. Admiral, is part of your charter to, to work with the Italians at all to try and designate ranges for this kind of flying? I mean, the services have ranges where, where you do that kind of flying in this country. Uh, we, as do the Italians, have some over in, uh, in, uh, in, in the, some of the other islands down in Sicily. They have, they have there are some areas. But this, uh, you know, the, the size of Italy is about like, uh, what is it, Florida and Alabama combined, something like that, Florida and Georgia combined. So they don't have a lot of options of, of places to go to do this type of training overland in Italy. So I, I, don't, I don't see uh, that, that might be a follow-on, but that's not something I see that we'll be working at. Yes. Can I ask a sync pack kind of question? <laughs> Can I ask one more on this? <laughs> I know you said that accountability is not part of your charter, uh, but is it possible, is it your understanding that uh, what you find may be used in any way in determining accountability? Uh, I, I think it's it's likely that it would. I think we are we're going to be working in uh, open covenants, openly arrived at in this uh, in 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 our investigation, and I would expect it to be you know in the public domain and be be used. One last. Okay. Uh, there was an announcement today from the State Department about North Korea agreeing to allow uh, access to this suspected site uh, of a nuclear facility. Mm -hmm. Can can you, uh, from a, a commander's point of view, is, is access uh, on a case-by-case -case basis enough, or do we need to get North Korea to uh, agree to a more broad uh, inspection regime? The, I will, one, uh, you know, that's, that's not really my dog anymore, but the, uh, uh, I, I think, Getting North Korea to agree is a very difficult task, and you know Dr. Perry is is uh, 
is reviewing the policy issue. He and he and Ash Carter are, and the 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 case by case basis is not the is not the objective, but it might be a suitable interim objective to you know as a first step in dealing with with North Korea. And uh, just one more. I'm just going to get. Uh, no, I, well, one more. <laughs> yeah. um, as an experienced <laughs> China observer. Um, what concerns do you have about uh, advancements in the Chinese nuclear weapon program and whether, you know, they actually uh, were assisted <coughs> by information from the United States? What um, — it, it's something we need to watch with great care. Uh, in, in our dealing with China, we need to have our eyes wide open. Uh, they are very talented and very pragmatic. And uh, we need to balance our — with strength, our respect for their legitimate issues, and deal with them with our eyes wide open on all issues, including the, the nuclear issue. Do you have any indication that uh, U.S. information assisted their program? I, I don't have any information other than what is available to all of you all that you you read in the papers too. The general peer has outlasted you all in Italy. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we also have uh, copies available of the directive that Secretary Clinton <coughs> issued appointing Admiral Preer, if you haven't picked that up on the way in. Uh, uh, I do have the uh, — the, uh, the, uh, Pardon? And the folks from the other services who are <coughs> No, the only pe person I have is the name of his counterpart, who is Lieutenant General Leonardo Tricar Tric Carico, and it's T R I C A R I C O, and he's the commander of the Fifth Allied Task Force in the Italian Air Force. And he's headed. Uh, he's headquartered in Vincenza, Italy. Uh, before I start, let me just take a minute to. Um, uh, uh, welcome a, a freelance journalist from the uh, uh, Netherlands, uh, Mr. Menno uh, Stichetti, who's uh, visiting us as a uh, guest of the U.S. Information Agency, one of a uh, long stream of uh, international journalists who come here to see how you people perform your job. So with that, I'll take your questions. Could yes, you give, you, give us a rundown on the, on the forces around, uh, around uh, Kosovo and their readiness? The numbers of planes, types. Uh, you're talking about uh, uh, Allied forces. Well, U.S. U.S. forces and, and the total NATO air force. Yeah, um, there is a, uh, a very large um, uh, NATO force uh, in the area, and uh, it's um, uh, close to uh, 400 uh, uh, Allied airplanes there now. Uh, we did have uh, over 400 uh, previously, but the, as you know, the carrier enterprise is left uh, for the Gulf, and that's uh, reduced the number of, of planes somewhat. But um, we have uh, other planes that we can bring in to uh, fill that gap and, and uh, will, um, if necessary. How many U.S. planes are uh, About uh, 250 U.S. planes. Is there <clears throat> oh, go ahead. No. Does that include the 12 F-117s? It does. It does. And, and, uh, and uh, are the B-52s still in The B-52s still are in uh, Britain, yes. Seven. Seven. You said that more U.S. planes will be brought in, or what, how did you put — what's the point on um, — We the have uh, plans to uh, fill the gap created by the carrier by bringing in uh, more U.S. planes that has not been done yet. Um, but there are plans to do that if necessary. The type they'd be F-15s, and they'd be it'd come down from other parts in Europe. Parts of Europe, not yeah, from the Europe. Right. Yes. What number of ships, sir. Are there any any significant number of ships nearby? Uh, yeah. Um, first of all, there's the uh, standing uh, NATO force um, in the area, 
And uh, there are uh, several um, uh, U.S. ships uh, in the area as well. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, we have the uh, cruiser uh, USS Philippine Sea is uh, on station in the Mediterranean. And there are also uh, uh, some uh, destroyers, the USS Nicholson, the USS Gonzales, and uh, uh, two um, uh, attack submarines uh, in the Mediterranean. And then there is the USS Thorn, which is uh, DD-988, is the flagship for NATO standing naval force Mediterranean, which is now in the Adriatic. And um, in that uh, uh, standing naval force is a German frigate, a Greek destroyer, an Italian frigate, a Dutch frigate, a Spanish frigate, a Turkish frigate, a um, uh, UK frigate, and um, again, the flagship uh, uh, USS Thorn a destroyer. So the United States has five Tomahawk shooters in the area, the Philippine Sea, the, the Nicholson and Gonzales, and the two submarines? Um, right. Is the Thorn a, 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 a Tomahawk shooter? I don't know that. We'll find out. Ken, what yes. can you uh, bring us up to date on or tell us about unusual or new Serb troop movements uh, into Kosovo, both mm. troops and equipment? The most disturbing report uh, uh, came from the uh, Kosovo verification mission this morning that the Serbs have moved in uh, seven uh, T-72 tanks uh, from the uh, uh, former uh, Republic of Yugoslavia into, um, into uh, Kosovo, so or into the Kosovo section. and. Uh, uh, that is um, probably the latest news about uh, about changes. There has been, as I've reported before, a buildup of uh, Serb forces uh, just outside of Kosovo, and um, there are probably now uh, 16 to 21,000 Serb forces gathered uh, around the perimeter of uh, of Kosovo. Um, and uh, with tanks and APCs. Uh, there also um, has been a, uh, a concentration of uh, Serb troops along the border between Kosovo and Macedonia, Firam, the former Yugoslav Republic of uh, Macedonia. And um, uh, that's been building for several, uh, several weeks numbers to that? Uh, not on that particular one along the border, simply because I, I don't have them. Um, we reckon that there are probably about um, uh, 14 to 18,000 troops um, in Kosovo now, and as I said, uh, 16 to 21,000 um, on the perimeter of Kosovo. Has there been any Can movement I... on anti-aircraft uh, report? Um, they have been moving uh, some around, yes. Uh, well, I, they've been. There has been some movement of their anti-aircraft assets, SAMs, and and guns as well. What appears to be the well, uh, it's it's hard to know, but it uh, it certainly, if you take what um, uh, the Serbs have said at face value, um, they're prepared to oppose uh, NATO airstrikes should they occur, and uh, they're prepared to oppose the entry of NATO. Uh, forces into Kosovo. Uh, they've also made very bellicose, threatening statements about the Albanians. And um, uh, one Serb political leader said recently that if, if there are NATO airstrikes or if NATO tries to move into uh, Kosovo, not one Albanian will be left alive. Um, they have made um, uh, other other leaders have made similar statements. So uh, it may be that. Um, that they're trying to uh, build up forces either to discourage NATO from going into Kosovo or to oppose a NATO move into Kosovo um, uh, or to
to uh, repress further the Albanians. And um, those are the three, three main options. I'll point out, as I have before, that our policy is that uh, NATO forces would only enter Kosovo um, under an agreement which would allow permissive entry. And uh, NATO has no intention of invading Kosovo. It would only come in under an agreement that would allow them to come in peacefully. But Elizabeth. Is there also a possibility that, that they are um, essentially making the, the Kosovo verification mission hostages to prevent the bombing? Um, I don't um, uh, see that um, uh, because they have agreed to allow the KVM to function uh, in, in Kosovo. They did that in October. And um, although the, uh, uh, the verifiers have encountered some um, uh, problems with both the Serbs and the Kosovo Albanians, they are continuing to do their job. They're continuing to move around. And um, I take their commitment to uh, allow the verifiers to do their work and to uh, work safely, seriously. And what do you make of the, uh, the buildup on the Macedonian border? Uh, is that to, uh, I mean, does that appear to be something that's threatening Macedonia, or, or do they seem to be postured for some other purpose? It may suggest that they've, uh, uh, they've merely uh, 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 miscalculated about what's going on in, in Macedonia. Right now, there, there are about 12,000 NATO troops in Macedonia that uh, are comprised of two, two groups. And uh, the one is the extraction force, the so-called X4. And there are about uh, 2,600 uh, uh, NATO troops in that. And then there, the, the balance are the so-called enabling force, which is being moved in uh, I think the largest uh, concentration would be British troops. There are over 4,000 British troops, I believe, as part of the enabling force, and they've moved in a fair amount of equipment that has come uh, uh, in through Greece and moved up over roads. Uh, but there are French and German soldiers there now, too. And that force is one that's just there to uh, prepare for a, a NATO move uh, uh, to operate as a peacekeeping force in Kosovo upon completion of a, a successful agreement between, uh, between Belgrade and the uh, Kosovar Albanians. So uh, that force is there to operate as a peacekeeping force under an agreement. Is there an armored force along the border there? Uh, they do have armor along the border, these, the uh, Serbs do. Uh, Ken, if uh, Serbia remains defiant uh, or non-permissive, uh, they take uh, air raids and they're still uh, non-permissive, and this is what they've been saying they'll do. Uh, uh, they will still not permit NATO to come in. Then the policy uh, then goes back uh, to NATO to decide if they will uh, pr permit some kind of a uh, non-permissive type of entry into Kosovo. Is that the, is that the next step if, if in fact, uh, Serbia is... Uh, is negative and defiant? No, I don't anticipate that will be the next step. That would, well, that would not be the next no. step? Uh, well, yesterday, uh, uh, Secretary Cohen said uh, he not to, not decide, that we have not decided to try to intervene in a non-permissive environment at this point. So I think he was saying that there might be a point where uh, a, d a different decision was made. <laughs> well, the, say what. the action that NATO has taken um, as you know, it's passed an activation order on January 30th uh, to um, allow uh, a, b a bombing um, uh, in the event that, um, that there is uh, uh, a humanitarian disaster or, or that the Serbs continue to uh, uh, obstruct the, the peace process. And that's a decision that still could be made by NATO. It hasn't been made yet, but it's, it's uh, now teed up to be made, and that decision would be made by the uh, Secretary General of NATO, uh, Solana. Can these 14,000 troops you say are in Kosovo now, those are regular Yugoslav army troops? Right? Yeah, those are the so-called BJ. Okay. Can, yeah. are, are we going to move uh, another carrier into the Adriatic area? 
Um, not right now. I, when, I don't know when the next one is scheduled to go in, but um, uh, it, uh, uh, we don't anticipate changing that schedule at the current time. I've just been handed a note that the USS Thorn is uh, Tomahawk capable. So there'd be six. Barbara. Going, going back a minute, the 16,000 to 21,000 troops around the perimeter of Kosovo, could you run through for us uh, what kind of armaments, tanks, APCs, armored vehicles they have with them in that area? Not in any great specificity. I haven't looked at the list. They have, you know, T-55 tanks and, um, <clears throat> well, they have um, uh, those around the border um, are divided into uh, deployed forces, uh, garrison forces, and reserve forces. And the deployed forces uh, have, um, have uh, about 96 tanks, and uh, the garrison forces have around 30 tanks in garrison. So uh, you, that gives you some sense of what they have. And one other question. The AAA movements that you're seeing, are those mostly around uh, Serbia and within Serbia, or are those in Kosovo as well? Well, there have been, uh, uh, I'd say, some of both. And did that include SAMs? I wasn't sure about your answer on that. Um, I said both. It's, uh, we're seeing movements of elements of the air defense system. They appear to be bracing for war rather than for a peace agreement. They appear to be doing, uh, they certainly are bracing for war, but they continue to participate in the talks. Yes. Uh, are you cutting back on the flow of details on uh, Northern Watch, Southern Watch up attacks? Um, I don't think we've, we're cutting back on the flow. We've been fairly parsimonious on the flow from the beginning. But I don't think there's been a cutback uh, in the details recently. <laughs> we continue to put out uh, releases which appear on the internet uh, every, every morning when there's, uh, well, when there's action. We're getting a little more detail on the planes involved, the bombs involved, and now uh, they're, they're, they're apparently not too forthcoming on the planes involved. I don't believe that's the case. I'll have to go back and check, but my... we getting my, less and less information every day. When we called uh, UCOM, CNN called UCOM today, they were, uh, they were told that all the information that would be made available was already on the website and uh, they wouldn't get into any more specifics, which includes target points. They will release the number of sites, which could include multiple target points. We don't know how many airplanes are involved, uh, how many munitions are, uh, are used. Um, uh, there is uh, an awful lot more that we don't know about this this ongoing low-level war in the skies over Iraq than uh, than what we do know. Um, well, this is a um, <clears throat> this is a as I say, an effort of self-defense. We are our pilots are taking fire every day. Um, I read the reports. They um, uh, sometimes SAMs are fired at them. Sometimes uh, anti-aircraft is fired at them. They've taken some. Uh, multiple launch rockets and tried to readjust them to shoot down planes and they're firing these rockets off sometimes and um, our planes are responding as they have from the very beginning of the enforcement of the no-fly zone they're responding to protect themselves and they're responding to uh, enforce the no-fly zones That's so general information you can get on this subject though I mean uh, early on in this uh, situation from December 28th uh, forward we were getting much more detail uh, and apparently the Pentagon decided that uh, there was a need to clamp down on this information and less and less and less information is being released with each passing incident. Uh, not only has no gun camera video been released in, uh, I think, two months now, uh, but the, uh, the flow of information is being stemmed um, every day. I think that we've been very clear from the beginning of this operation. Um, that uh, we, uh, our pilots are under fire every single day, and we are going to be uh, very careful about the information we give out. Uh, this has uh, gone on for a long while. The Iraqis show no sign of quitting. Quite the opposite. They show signs of looking for new ways to attack our pilots and uh, looking for new ways to rebuild their defenses. And in light of this ongoing campaign, against uh, our pilots and the British pilots, the other country in the coalition, um, we are going to be as careful as possible uh, to uh, protect our pilots and make sure they can do their job. What and is the reason for keeping the 
details of these uh, daily exchanges from the public and from the families of the pilots and uh, everybody else. Iraq knows how many sites have been bombed. Iraq knows how many bombs have been dropped. Uh, Iraq knows how many planes have come into their airspace, but that information is not released by the Pentagon. Um, as I said, we want to give out as little information as possible that the Iraqis may be able to use to calibrate the types of packages that are used on certain days or against certain targets. And um, uh, they can observe certain things, but we don't have to give them extra information, and we're not. Well, you're not giving anyone information. Uh, you know, is this not because you don't want to see well, these running tallies? Well, unfortunately, information is not uh, divisible. We can't give information to CNN and not give it to Iraq. Um, we can't give information to Newsday and not have it uh, flow into the general uh, stream of information. But you've also said that 20 percent, you said that you've destroyed, quite a while ago, you said you destroyed 20 percent of Iraq's anti-aircraft ability. The Secretary no, no, said we didn't say that. We didn't say that. You said you We said strategic SAMs, All right. which is different. But the Secretary also said that most of the SAMs have been withdrawn to central Iraq. Many have, um, yes. Leading one to believe that, in fact, the threat had gone down rather than increased, and yet the raids on the northern and southern zones have increased. And then he's, as he said, these, these releases now say a threat from Iraqi radar. It doesn't say whether or not those radars have, are targeted these planes or have targeted planes. It simply says in response to a threat from Iraqi radar. Is the presence of an Iraqi radar threat enough? That's right. I mean, well, it's a very we, vague release. Without of getting into our rules of engagement, um, we have always been able to uh, react against uh, certain types of radar illuminations. The very existence of them, whether or not they are targeting the planes or Well, uh, we don't, uh, I don't think threat conveys the idea that it's the very existence of a radar that poses a threat to our planes. I don't know why you would read well, that into the term threat. The this radar has been turned on and threatens the planes. I think it's in, it, it is, uh, um, uh, there is no doubt if uh, you have seen pilots quoted in the press um, as they were last night on a network that the pilots believe they're under fire. Um, you traveled with the secretary and um, had a chance to talk with some pilots. Um, and uh, uh, you had a chance to hear them express their feelings about whether they're under fire or not. I don't think they expressed uh, any doubt whatsoever that they're under fire. Last night's uh, example is an exception, though. Normally, reporters are not granted access to Ansar Lake Gordon, certainly not to the bases in the Middle East where uh, our planes are originating from. Uh, and uh, that's not a good example of the kind of access that we have. Uh, I guess that I would have to say that your, your comment to me that, uh, that access is extraordinary um, uh, doesn't really hold water either because you've just cited two, two examples of where reporters have gotten access. And those are the rarest of and examples. And also had reporters point. on carriers. A carrier is the one place you can get access to on occasion. Would you say that there's a low-level war going on with Iraq right now? No. I would say that our pilots are every day taking actions to defend themselves as they patrol the no-fly zone. And at what point does it become a low-level war? I think in the mind of the press it already has come a low-level war. Um, but if it is a low-level war, it's one that's been provoked um, by Saddam Hussein. Do you think if there were gun uh, videos on television every night of bombs exploding in Iraq that the public would have the perception that there was a low-level war going on? I think the public uh, would see that um, uh, would, uh, would have visible evidence for what they already understand, which is that our planes are taking fire and they're defending themselves. Do we have that visible evidence? You've had some visible evidence. There has been... Well, it, they all look pretty much the same. Yes, Chris. Um, the, the sources for information about what's going on in, in Iraq are, are two, uh, the United States government and Iraq. Now, Iraq's uh, accounts are often rather fanciful. Uh, they've shot down a number of planes, according to their accounts. Um, so don't you think there's a special responsibility on the United States government as the, as the only vaguely reliable source on this to, to, to point out what exactly is going on, because otherwise the world has, has no source of information on this. Well, or think, do you want to have a secret war? I think that, uh, that, that all you have to know is, uh, is several things. First, you have to know that Iraq has um, uh, uh, threatened to shoot down American planes, has uh, proclaimed that as a goal, and has offered a bounty uh, to do this. Uh, two, uh, following through on this threat, they are uh, shooting at our planes uh, with uh, quite 
uh, with some regularity um, on an almost daily basis. And uh, three, our planes, um, as any sensible Air Force would do, um, is firing back to defend the pilots and to allow them to perform their mission, which is to patrol the no-fly zone. Uh, those are the three central facts here. Well, A fourth we, fact, which I've said... Uh, hit one of our planes, not, uh, not recently. Well, I think that there's, uh, they have not given up trying. Um, they still have a missile capability. They do, from time to time, fire missiles at our planes. Uh, they did recently. Uh, they frequently fire anti-aircraft um, uh, guns at our planes, 100 millimeter guns. And they have fired rockets at our planes. And they do, uh, from time to time, illuminate our planes with radar, which would lead any reasonable person to believe that a missile might be coming uh, shortly thereafter. So um, uh, these are not idle threats. And they're threats that we take with great seriousness. And that's what we're doing every single day. We're challenged by Iraq. We're responding. It yes? Is, you, you've said uh, in the past, I believe, that there have been something like 200,000 sorties enforcing the no-fly no zone. How does that number of sorties uh, compare with uh, other things that were acknowledged to be wars, like, say, Vietnam or Korea? Well, first of all, the number of sorties that we've made since 1991 um, have, uh, for the large part, been unchallenged. The challenges to the, uh, the flights have only come in the last um, several months, since December 28th. And uh, so the vast uh, majority, the overwhelming percentage of these sorties have been unchallenged. They've just simply been planes going up and uh, patrolling the no-fly zone and coming back without incident. Starting in late December, that whole uh, uh, dynamic changed, and the planes started coming under very regular fire. Uh, Ken, following, following the U.S. invasion of Grenada uh, and all the questions, suspicions, and ultimate confirmations of blown missions and, and enemies that perhaps really weren't there at the time, uh, the Pentagon uh, sat down with the media. They appointed the Seidel Commission and, and established a working uh, order, relationship, uh, between the media and the military on future coverage of uh, U.S. military operations. Has the Pentagon now abandoned uh, what was uh, sort of the spirit or intent of the Seidel Commission in covering U.S. military operations? Uh, not at all. In fact, one of the most significant changes to come out of that was the whole pool approach. And that pool approach is alive and well. As most of you know, you serve on pools from time to time. And we activate the pools um, at various times. So um, I don't think that has changed. Uh, and I don't think that, uh, that this is going uncovered. I see stories in the press every day about it. Um, uh, I've seen reports on television from people who have uh, been on carriers and been to Insulik, and I've seen reports from people who've been elsewhere writing about this. So I, I don't take uh, the criticism that there's no coverage of this. But those, those reports are based on what you say. He said something about fanciful reports out of Iraq. All we have is what you say. You say that those planes are being fired at regularly, and, and these attacks are apparently always in response to being fired at or targeted. All we have is your, your word for that. I mean, we go through up the Gulf with the Secretary, and you all say that, that, that leaders in the Gulf have no argument with U.S. policy, and yet the only guy we get a crack at to talk to is, is the Foreign Minister of, of Qatar, who says that he, in fact, is against daily attacks and these no-fly zones. He did say that he agreed with overall U.S. policy, but he said he did not agree with the daily attacks. And yet you say that, 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 that Gulf leaders, all of the Gulf leaders agree with, with these attacks on U.S. policy in Iraq. I mean, all we have is you all's word to go on this, and yet you won't provide pictures to back it up, as he says. Well, I think you're mixing apples and oranges there. But the, uh, the fact of the matter is that um, uh, you were um, at, a, at a meeting with some pilots, and the pilots did, in fact, talk about being attacked. Bill. Yeah, let, me, let me ask, uh, so, what, so the U.S. Uh, uh, status currently in the no-fly zones is reactive. The U.S. is reacting to, to what Iraq is uh, dishing out, so to speak. Does the United States have a plan or plans in mind to become more proactive, Ken, to bring this, this, this whole business uh, uh, to an end? 
this whole business of risking American pilots uh, uh, and on a day-to-day -day basis. Is there, is there some, such a plan? Um, we are doing the best we can to uh, suppress the threat that our pilots face. Is there a, a, a policy or an end game that, uh, that we should be aware of that we're not? Yeah, the end game is when Saddam Hussein start shooting, stops shooting at our planes, we'll stop shooting back. So, so we're locked in to an indefinite engagement that uh, will ultimately cost the United States planes and pilots. Well, correct? I think it's fortunate. This is a risky operation, and that, is, of course, is a possibility. Um, that's one of the reasons why our pilots have been so determined to uh, suppress the air, to threat, air, to f air threats that they're facing every day. They have, have they put up any aircraft in the past couple of weeks? When was the last time they put up aircraft yesterday? Yesterday. Can we engage a uh, different subject? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. You notice that people, people are diving for the ex exits <laughs> on this subject, <laughs> and I might be the next one to go, so I'd be glad, <laughs> to, be <laughs> glad, to, be glad to change. Have any happen. U.S. planes been damaged at all um, in these uh, Iraqi efforts to strike a U.S. or a British plane? Uh, uh, thank God, no. Um, what either reaction or details can you add um, to the announcement by state uh, that there's an agreement to investigate the mysterious hole in the ground in North Korea? Um, uh, none. None whatsoever. Um, uh, I, I saw the uh, part of the announcement, and uh, um, uh, all I have is the state guidance on it. They've negotiated it, and I would recommend you talk to them. Do you anticipate U.S. military participation on the team? I, I just have no details at this at this time. Thank you. Can Can you, you <laughs> Two updates. The secretary was to be brief today on the, uh, the department's review of the general dynamics Newport News proposal. Do you know? Uh, can you give us any kind of readout on that? Where the review stands? I don't know where you got that information. I don't see that um, uh, on the schedule. Um, but I do, I do not know. I do not, uh, I do not know. I'll have to find out where it stands. Uh, can uh, the Marines, uh, are there, Kosovo, are they, um, uh, have any U.S. forces gone into Macedonia as, um, as part of that enabling force? Uh, there have been survey teams in and out of Macedonia, but there have been no uh, permanent deployments. Uh, into Macedonia. You know that we do have Task Force Able Sentry, which is a UN operation, and uh, we have 350 uh, Army troops in that. But um, we do not have uh, p participation in the enabling force now. Is that contingent of Marines still, offshore, still in the Med? Uh... Well, it's in the Med. Um, I think uh, the uh, uh, USS Nassau and the 24th Mu are supposed to be there until um, the third week of April or so. Thank now, when you get that 12,000 number for NATO troops, you know, the enabling plus the extraction, that was just NATO. That wasn't counting the, uh, the able sentry. Um, that did not. Sentry. It did not so. count uh, task force able sentry. You're right. Thanks for pointing that out. Uh, thank you. Uh, you're supposed to announce tomorrow that I haven't had.